Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and we are asking the most important questions first, which is what is the Solution Architect Associate? So this is a concept-based AWS certification. I say that because it's mostly focused on conceptual knowledge as opposed to implementation, but this will cover the broadest amount of core AWS services, light knowledge on implementation, a larger focus on theoretical limits and functionality of AWS services, and a light focus on high level architecting cloud workloads and choosing the appropriate AWS service to meet the business use case. Uh, the course code for the Solutions Architect Associate is the SAA S03. So make sure when you book your exam that the course code matches uh, what we show here because this is what this course is optimized for. The Solution Architect Associate is the most popular cloud certification among all cloud certifications, but it's also the most saturated certification. So consider accompanying the certification with other skills. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we look at the um, future slides in this video here. So who is the certification for? We'll consider the SAA if you want to work as a cloud engineer. Notice I didn't say solutions architect. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit more here in a moment, but generally a cloud engineer or a cloud developer is what this kind of content is targeted for. If you enjoy the idea of understanding how to architect multiple services together into a cloud workload, then uh, this is a great course for that. Though they all kind of do that anyway for all the associates, but this one has a larger focus on it. Uh, or if you just don't know which associate to take, uh, then uh, you should just take this one because it's the general one and then you can figure out after afterwards what you'd really want to focus on. So let's take a look at our AWS certification roadmap. As of today, these are the certifications that are available. And these are the lines that I have drawn as possible paths that you can take and possible uh, cloud related roles that you might want to target. Um, but I do want to point out that AWS certifications do not validate programming, technical diagramming, code management, and many other technical skills that are required for obtaining technical roles. I have seen people uh, get like seven certifications all the way to pro and specialties. And then we, when we went to evaluate their skills, we found out they did not know how to clone a Git repo. Uh, they did not know how to write a lick of code. So it is possible to pass these by just studying the lecture content, but I'm gonna tell you that if you want to be job ready, you need to uh, do some extra work. One other thing that I would like to just suggest as a uh, way of optimizing your study pattern, even if you don't plan on taking the other associates like the sysops administrator, the developer, or the data engineer, you can study the sysops administrator, the solution architect associate, and the developer associate at the same time because they have a lot of overlap. And I personally recommend doing that because you'll just save yourself a considerable amount of time and get uh, the right amount of knowledge you're going to need to be something like a cloud engineer or any of those um, in in entry level uh, or early or like junior level roles uh, in cloud roles, okay? So how long does it take to study this uh, certification? Well, if you're a beginner, you're looking about at 60 hours. So let's assume that you have the AWS Cloud Practitioner. You've never written code or held a tech role. Um, so yeah, you're looking at that. If you are experienced, so you have practical uh, experience working with AWS and you have the equivalent experience of other um, certifications um, or CSPs, then you are probably going to be looking at 20 hours. This certification has grown in time. So it used to be half the time like three years ago, but AWS has just added so many more services and they've increased the difficulties of the exam. Um, and there's more expected of you. So understand that the study time is just much longer. I would say average study time probably would be 24 hours, split your time between lectures and labs and practice exams. So as much time as you put into the um, lecture lab content, you should probably put into practice exams. I recommend one to two hours a day for 24 days, try to contain all your study time within a month. I find that people that uh, take two months or three months, uh, they feel like they've gone through all the content, but in reality, they've forgotten the stuff uh, at the start of their journey. Um, and then they have to uh, uh, extra study to remember the information that they forgot. So understand that there. So what does it take to pass the exam? Well, watch the video lectures and memorize key information, do the hands-on uh, labs and follow-ongs with your own account. And I highlight follow alongs or the labs uh, in red because you really, really should do them. Um, and my approach is that I like to do a lot of labs and try to make them as real world as possible. 
So you will find that that is what you'll see a lot in my courses. Um, and there'll be less of these beautiful looking diagrams, but um, they don't necessarily teach you the practical skills. So understand that. Uh, I would strongly recommend getting some paid online practice exams that simulate the real exam. Um, and if you just don't have the money, but you need a, a practice exam, we do have a full free practice exam on the exam pro platform, which you can find at exampro.co forward slash SAA hyphen C zero three. Um, so make sure you get access to that. So you do better on your exam. Let's talk about the uh, content outline and we will open up the exam guide PDF and we'll take a closer look at that after this video. The exam of uh, questions is broken into four domains. Each domain has its own weighting, and this determines how many questions in a domain that will show up. So the first domain is design secure architecture. Domain two is design resilient architecture. Domain three is design high performing architecture. And domain four is cost optimized architectures. Now, I recently sat the exam just to make sure that I my content matched the uh, the exam guide in this domain breakdown. And I was really surprised to see that it did not. So I think what's happening here is that over time, because this certification is not new, I mean, it's like 2014 or older. Uh, but since the last refresh, it's just Inibus has added so much content, so many services, so much stuff. And I would just say this service uh, or this certification in particular is very bloated. Uh, and they've shoved everything to, into that exam guide. And uh, the reality is that the exam guide breakdown of skills does not accurately, act, accurately reflect the required knowledge of the exam. So I'll give you a really clear example is the first domain. The first domain says 30%. Okay, so design secure architectures. And I'm gonna tell you, the exam wasn't that heavy on security. Um, and th there is a security specialty exam. So I think what we're looking at here is marketing um, and it's unfortunate, but uh, I just think that it's the nature of uh, these being around for so long. So I'm hoping that AWS uh, will uh, fix it or adjust it at some point, uh, but we'll have to see what happens there. So just understand that even though it says 30% design secure architecture, it's not as security focused as it says it is. So where would you take this exam? Well, you can take it at an in-person test center. And if you have that option, I strongly recommend it as uh, then you're eliminating a lot of factors in your environment that will stress you out. You can do it online, which I have to do because I no longer live near a test center, uh, but it can be stressful. But you have to choose what is going to work for you. Um, it just delivers exams via Pearson View um, and the Pearson View network of test centers. So they used to have PSI, uh, PSI online, but uh, they've stopped offering that. So um, it's weird because it used to be PSI only, then they added Pearson. And then they got rid of uh, PSI online and, and the PSI network. And Pearson is a much better experience than PSI. So you're very lucky there. Uh, these exams are proctored. So I put it in uh, double quotations because I almost wonder if they're using assisted AI to do it these days. But the idea is that there is someone supervising or a person who's monitor monitoring uh, students during an examination to prevent cheating. So uh, just be prepared that you might have to interact with somebody and you'll have to show your workspace and things like that. Um, let's talk about grading. So to pass exam, you need to get 720 points out of 1,000. And uh, I have an asterisk there because it uses scaled scoring. So the idea is that um, it's around that amount. So we always say around 72% because you could literally get 72% and fail because of uh, various factors. But I would always say just aim to get about, like when you're trying to pra uh, go for uh, practice exams, make sure you're like 10%, 50% over. Um, so you're not uh, getting too close to that 72% because it'd be very frustrating to get 72% and fail, but it can happen. Let's talk about res uh, response types um, and the formatting questions. So there are 65 questions, 50 scored questions, and 15 unscored questions. And that means you can afford to get 15 questions wrong because they're never going to be scored. Um, there is no penalty for wrong questions. Uh, the format of questions here is multiple choice and multiple answer. So, um, you know, it's not like there's labs or anything else. So, um, you know, understand that things can get pretty wordy. And it does, um, I, I mean, I like how they write their questions, or at least I used to. But, um, you know, you have to 
when you do practice exams, you have to get used to reading the flow of it and cutting out the garbage text so you can just understand uh, the questions and maybe we'll look at some examples in another video. Um, but anyway, let's talk about those unscored questions. So there are 15 questions uh, on the exam that are unscored. They will not count towards your final score. Why are they here? Um, it's to evaluate the introduction of new questions, determine if the exam is too easy and the passing score or question difficulty needs to be increased. Uh, it's used for uh, detecting cheaters or people that are stealing dump exam questions because, I don't know, there are mechanisms for how it works. But anyway, if you encounter questions you've never studied for that seem really hard, keep your cool. Remember, they may be unscored questions. Let's talk about the duration here. So you have um, 1.5 hours for the exam and you get 1.5 minutes per questions and the exam time is 90 minutes and the seat time is 120 minutes. Um, is that right? So I almost have a feeling that the time is longer. Let me just go check one moment. I just want to make sure that's still true. Yep, so I thought that looked a bit odd and actually they give you more time now. So now it's 2.1 hours and you get, um, <laughs> I'm dragging my pen out here, uh, uh, two minutes per question. So the exam time is 100, uh, 130 minutes and the seat time is 160 minutes. We always just add 30 minutes for seat time. Seat time refers to the amount of time that you should allocate for the exam because they tell you to check in 30 minutes early or even an hour earlier early. It includes time to review instructions, show online proctor your workspace, read and accept the NDA, complete the exam, provide the feedback at the end. Uh, these certifications should be valid for 36 months for three years before recertification. I did not see any change, so this seems like this is the same. Um, so yeah, that's pretty clear there. And I just want to have some real talk with you about certifications and goals just because uh, the certifications are very different from 2016. It's almost like 10 years ago. Uh, uh, and I just want to make it clear how they fit in your, uh, your work goals or your career goals, uh, just so that you're getting realistic advice here. Um, but the Adobe Solution Architect will not make you a solutions architect. And a lot of people think that, that they get the cert, now they can apply for SA roles, and it's not going to happen. I'm going to tell you why, because a solution architect is a senior role that is given to those with years of experience. We're talking like a decade or more experience and deep knowledge of implementing technical workloads. And it might be possible to get a role as an SA, but it's probably only in title and you'd actually be working as a cloud engineer. So you will not land a solution architect role in nine months. You won't land one in three years. Uh, they're highly sought after just because of the nature of, um, of, of these roles. But that does not mean that a cloud engineer role is not a great role to have or a cloud developer role is not great to have. But um, you know, understand that it will take time uh, to get to this if you want to do that. An obtainable role would be cloud engineer or cloud developer. And you need to uh, complement this certification with deeper implementation knowledge found in other certifications, um, such as the developer associate, which will teach you developer tools, deployment, applications, programming, APIs. They don't teach you programming, but you have to have those skills to um, uh, utilize services, the sysops administrator, so cloud networking, infrastructure automation, servers like Linux or Windows, um, things like that, personal projects uh, like architecting and then implementing complex solutions. So understand that uh, it does not end with certifications, but certifications is giving you a bulk knowledge of cloud knowledge without the actual base knowledge underneath. Uh, another thing I need to point out is AWS itself does not care about AWS certifications for hiring for their own technical roles. If you're thinking that you're going to go work for AWS, getting all the AWS certifications, they don't care. Uh, when you get hired at AWS, um, they then will encourage you to get certifications when you're there, but not, um, but not as a prerequisite to try to get hired. Um, certifications serve a structured way of learning with a goalpost. So that is the purpose of certifications. And if companies outside of Amazon Partner Networks or AWS Partner Networks or AWS, um, uh, whether they care about them or not is up to those individual companies. But just understand, again, the SA is highly saturated, so you can put it on your resume, but you need to, again, round out those skills with other things. So cloud certifications expect you to already have these foundational technical skills. So you're already supposed to know programming, scripting, SQL, IT networking, Linux and Windows servers at a low level. Uh, project management, uh, that could also include um, code management like uh, Git and GitHub, developer tools, and not the tools that are in the cloud, but the developer tools you need to 
uh, build things, application development skills. Uh, you might need comp sci alg algorithmic skills, systems design, and more. Um, and so where would you get this knowledge? Because they're not generally required. So most uh, certification courses that aren't mine won't teach you this stuff. Um, they'll just teach you to pass the exam. So you can get this knowledge from FreeCodeCamp. FreeCodeCamp teaches a lot of this stuff, but you will have to know what to uh, search for, um, whether it's like Java or uh, Rust or learning about um, caches or whatever. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, we also have an offering on Exam Pro. Um, most of our stuff is free, but what we're finding is that a lot of people taking certifications have these gaps, and then they go to Free Code Camp and they can find information, but it's not optimized uh, specifically for cloud roles, um, and it might not have contextual information how we would work on the job. And so we have this Exam Pro supporter subscription that you can pay for. And the idea is that if you're in there, then um, I will survey folks, ask them what kind of content they want, and I'll produce it. And uh, this is a more effective way to fill those gaps that you absolutely need. And one thing that uh, people really want for me is like portfolio projects and things like that. So that would be something that I uh, would consider if, if people want us to um, create. So just consider that as well, okay? Um, and so there's three more things I just wanted to tell you, and this is specifically about how we're trying to help you get these real world skills in these certifications. So in our hands-on instructions, we will do our best to try and fill these gaps, but I can't make all of the content have all that information because they're basically like entire courses. So I'm basically um, speed running you through those components, but I don't skip them. So uh, other courses, what they'll do is they'll just have staged things and then you stand them up, but you have no idea how you'd even build that stuff. But I actually go through and do that. So there's like a video where we literally build an app before we, we go and deploy it. And so you'll find that sometimes we'll be spending considerable amount of time uh, coding or doing something prior to using the service. So it might feel like the video is 75% not the cloud service and then 25% or 10% is, but that's what's important. And that's what I'm finding that people need. Um, so just understand that our labs are long and, and they're not heavily edited because I do not want to leave things out. Um, and if I run into problems, I want to show you the troubleshooting. That's the part that you should want to watch, okay? Uh, some hands-on labs might end in failed implementations, but are left uh, in to experience the troubleshooting or the accurate reflection of what it's like to work with the specific cloud services. Just because it's on the exam and you have to learn it doesn't mean that you would actually want to use that service in production or for a company. Um, and Anabus does ship a lot of services as like an MVP and they never get any better. Um, and so, you know, if I'm having frustration with the service and I've been using Anabus for over a decade and, and I've been uh, multiple decades working, uh, you know, in this field, then you should take my advice there and understand that uh, you might not be worth your time to utilize it. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, again, it's like the troubleshooting and, and debugging and, and, and trying to work through stuff is what you should want to obtain because it gives you real insight and allows you to, um, uh, you know, solve things on your own, okay? Uh, we try and do our best to clean up costly infrastructure, but you should always be proactive and check if resources are left running. We made the Anibus Cloud Practitioner course, and we showed you all the pricing stuff and how to avoid pricing. If you didn't do that course first, do that one. Don't skip it. And specifically, don't skip mine because in mine, I go always beyond the requirements of the certifications um, to give you that real world knowledge because I want you to be job ready or I want you to be able to apply it right away. Um, and even in this, when I'm shooting labs, sometimes in other videos, I'll be like, oh, I forgot to clean this up. Might be an S3 bucket that doesn't have any spend. But my point is, is that you need to be responsible and and be very diligent about checking your costs and spend every day, okay? So, you know, be aware of that. But yeah, uh, that's about it. And we'll go take a look at the exam guide, okay?